Thank you for listening to Scandinavian Crimes Podcast. Be sure to check out the episode links and be part of our other social media platforms where you can leave a topic suggestion or even share some of your insights regarding the subject matter of the episode. We will always do our best to provide a well-researched episode, but sometimes due to limited access to information and translation issues, some information can be lost. It is therefore good to do your own research and get a deeper understanding of a case of your own interest. So with that all said, let us start today's episode. Welcome to another episode of Scandinavian Crimes. My name is Devante and say hello to my lovely co-host, Delilah. Hi. And on this podcast, we cover famous Scandinavian criminals who made their mark throughout Scandinavian history. So today's case is a unfortunate and very sad case. Uh, this case involves a child murder, obviously by the title. This case involves a kid, a Swedish child by the name of Kevin, whose death was investigated um, on Sunday, August 16th. Well, the investigation began, sorry, let me correct myself. On August 16th, 1998, when four-year-old Kevin Jarlmerson was found dead in Arvika. Two brothers, age five and seven at the time, were initially charged with the crime and allegedly confessed to the murder. However, they were never convicted by a court and remained only reasonable suspects. So this is going to be very sad for those people who are very sensitive to cases like this. So brace yourself. Uh, it's not too graphic in terms of the uh, the contents of this particular episode, but the situation is very sad. So uh, just keep that in mind. And uh, nonetheless, you already know what to do. Go ahead, grab your tea, grab your snacks. If you're on your way to work, be sure to tuck yourself into a nice little corner, right? You know, in that back corner, you know, you know how it is on a train and a bus where you really want to be left alone and really listen up. This is a case of Kevin Yalmason. Kevin Yarmulsen was born and raised in Doltevik, a town in Arvika situated at Shirkviken Bay. Kevin left his parents' home at 1600 hours on Sunday, August 16th, 1998, to play with other children in the Doltevik residential area. He was last seen alive by his friends around 1700 hours. When his mother started looking for him at 2030, he was missing and she asked for help from Kevin's grandparents who also lived nearby in the neighborhood. 15 minutes later, Kevin's grandfather found him lifeless on top of two pallets in the reeds at Shirkviken, a few hundred meters from the parents' home. The communication center was alerted by SOS by 2131 about a possible drowning incident. However, the intelligence service, known as KUT, conducted a thorough victim analysis aimed at understanding Kevin's background. They contacted relatives, neighbors, local residents, and daycare staff to gather information. The resulting portrayal of Kevin resembled more of that of a stray puppy seeking company rather than that of a typical four-year-old boy. Kevin's family situation was complex. His parents had separated before his birth, and he had limited contact with his father during his early years. Despite this, Kevin frequently visited his grandparents nearby and interacted with other families, including that of a five-year-old boy who later became a suspect in the case. This way, Kevin became well-known throughout the neighborhood. He might have done all this to seek a social connection and stability that he lacked at home. Kevin had both friends and adversaries among the local children and had developed a somewhat rough manner of speaking, indicative of his need to establish his own rules as well as boundaries. He likely possessed strong self-confidence, but was very wary of trusting people and others, relying primarily on himself. The police also conducted a comprehensive survey of Daltovic residential area, uncovering unpleasant environments. Daltovic, despite its picturesque location by Glafsjorden, suffered from a reputation of lower social status. Many children seemed to lack a stable home environment and instead sought companionship among their peers. Raised in fragile family situations with single parents navigating complex relationship dynamics, these children were forced to forge their own paths. Interaction between children and adults was limited 
with children often left on their own devices and play as well as socialize. While most residents lived respectable lives, the police findings underscored the presence of unprotected children exposed to conditions and norms that were far from ideal. Behind the polished facades of some homes lay environments deemed harmful to children. By the third day of investigation, three distinct leads were established. The pedophile lead, the family lead, and the children lead. This was all led by Rolf Sandberg, who took the role of lead investigator for the Kevin case. Initially, the police believed it was a drowning accident based on the SOS call, but injuries on the body led them to request an extended forensic autopsy. The coroner determined that Kevin had been sexually assaulted and then murdered. A survey was conducted to determine the whereabouts of the known sex offenders in the area at the time. Initially in the case, suspicion leaned heavily towards the pedophile lead, but eventually it took a different turn. On the day of the incident, several witnesses reported seeing known pedophiles near Kevin, with one individual even seen holding Kevin's hand while crossing his street. There also lived a pedophile just 100 meters from Kevin's mother's home. Some of the suspected pedophiles had a history of photographing children and displaying concerning behavior indicative of abuse. Another known pedophile residing in Dotovic was later convicted and sentenced to five years in prison for sexually assaulting a three-year-old. The family lead was explored as well, recognizing the common occurrence of serious crimes among individuals within family social circles. Drawing from statistical data and past experiences, it was well researched that perpetrators often emerge within the family circle. This perspective was further underscored by the rarity of instances where young children outside the home fall victim to fatal, to fatal violence, hence putting, them, hence putting this lead to rest. Police forensic technicians continue to meticulously comb through the crime scene. It had been evident that the murder site differed from the location where the body was found. Kevin's footwear and sock were discovered behind a red shed. Within this area, technicians also uncovered a broken branch that had impressions from the child's hand on the inside with the strands of hair. It remained unclear whether these belonged to Kevin, as no fingerprints or hair samples or even DNA testing had been taken from them. Kevin had traces of sand in his undergarments, with the nearest sandy spot being by the red shed, indicating his possible murder around that area. However, no signs of dragging were observed, were observed, either on the ground or on Kevin's body, with no abrasions evident on his skin. The forensic team dismissed the pedophile lead, believing it improbable that a pedophile would leave the body exposed on a pallet in the reeds. Upon observing marks on the photographed body, technicians concluded that Kevin had likely been suffocated with a stick, possibly attempting to resist the pressure with the palms of his hand. The investigation progressed into its fourth day, with staff tirelessly working to crack the case. The investigation progressed into its fourth day with staff tirelessly working to crack the case. After a week of investigation, the focus began shifting towards the involvement of children. Through the analysis of interviews, flowcharts, and mappings of locations and individuals, a group of eight boys quickly became a potential, quickly became potential suspects. These boys had been close to the crime scene on the day in question, the children underwent interrogation, but receiving truthful responses proved extremely challenging. The police were astonished by the children's varying perceptions of reality and their ability to fabricate detailed falsehoods. Recognizing the need for specialists' experience in questioning children, Rolf sought the assistance from other law enforcement agencies within the county. Increasingly, more resources were directed towards the children's lead, particularly after Professor Rammer from Forensic Medicine visited Arvika to clarify the autopsy findings on Kevin's body. The preliminary report, when he asserted, sorry, in the preliminary report, when he asserted that Kevin had suffered sexual abuse based on this white substance observed around the body's anus, it was later revealed upon closer examination to be a thermometer to be thermometer ointment used by the hospital doctor in Arvika to measure body temperature and estimate the time of death. One of Kevin's playmates, a five-year-old boy named Robin Dahlin, told his parents he had seen something, prompting them to take him to the police, believing he might have been a witness. As the interrogations with Robin began, the boy's statements changed with each session, 
perplexing investigators. However, his seven-year-old brother, Christian Carlson, provided a consistent and detailed story, identifying individuals that led to the temporary suspicion of the two other older teenage boys. It would take a considerable amount of time before Robin disclosed the truth about what had occurred. The police also worked with Professor Sven Olke Christensen, an expert in child behavior who played a crucial role in the investigation. Upon reviewing some of these interviews conducted by Robin and Christian, Professor Sven Olke quickly assessed that the two brothers were not just witnesses, but likely participants in the death of Kevin. The police quickly turned the suspicion towards the brothers and even more interrogations were made. At a press conference in November 1998, the police announced the conclusion of their investigation. The case was deemed solved when the boys had confessed to the murder of Kevin. They would not be prosecuted or formally convicted because children under 15 cannot be convicted of crimes in Sweden. They remain in a legal sense only reasonable suspects. However, if children are suspected of serious crimes, a proof claim can be made, which is a trial in court without a conviction leading to punishment. This must be requested by the guardian, who was not informed that this was possible. Consequently, the case was never brought to the district court and the brothers were placed under the care of social authorities for treatment in the child and adolescent psychiatric care. In late April 2017, the major Swedish newspaper Dagens New Heater in late April 2017, the major Swedish newspaper Dagens Nyheter and the Swedish public television network SVT began exposing potential serious flaws in the investigation through a series of articles and documentaries. It revealed several irregularities in how the interrogation and handling of the brothers were conducted. The article highlighted numerous and lengthy interrogation practices that child interrogation experts considers counterproductive and prone to eliciting false confessions. They concluded that the interview techniques used in the case were unscientific, contradicted existing scientific knowledge, and relied on methods lacking scientific support. The brothers revealed that the police used threats and rewards to coerce them into confessing to the crime with questions often being overly leading. The alleged confessions that led to the closing of the investigation were never documented on audio or video, despite having recordings of several other interrogations of the brothers. On top of this, the claimed confession came from more than 30 lengthy interrogations, sometimes conducted without a parent present. Throughout the investigation, neither the boys nor the family had any legal representation. The brothers allegedly had an alibi, but the key witness was completely ignored. Sven Ok was involved in the Kevin case investigation from an early stage. He is a Swedish psychologist, psychotherapist, and researcher currently serving as a professor at Stockholm University. His research focuses on human memory functions, criminality, psychological trauma, and interview techniques. However, his methods had been criticized for potentially inducing memories and suspects through reconstruction-like walkthroughs. He has provided expert testimony to count to courts on topics including perpetrators of serious sexual and violent crimes, traumatic experiences in children and adults, and cognitive interview techniques. His expertise has influenced several high-profile legal cases, and he is best known for his involvement in the Arboga Woman case and the trials of Thomas Quick, which are both episodes we covered. In recent years, researchers and investigative journalists have questioned the validity of his methods who claim that he contributed to erroneous conclusions and investigations. His involvement in the Thomas Quick and Kevin cases have been particularly criticized. On May 8th, 2017, the district attorney decided to reopen the preliminary exam sorry, investigation into the case following new information uncovered during reviews by Doggins New Heater and the SVT documentary series. The investigation concluded on March 27th, 2018, that the brothers were cleared of all suspicion due to unclear, contradictory, and inconsistent previous interrogations. As an alternative explanation, the prosecutor leading the preliminary investigation suggested that Kevin's death may have resulted from an accident, speculating that he was crushed between the pallets where he was later discovered. 
However, criminologist expert Leif Person asserted that murder was a more plausible scenario, implicating a 13-year-old who had been seen playing with Kevin on the day of his death and had provided a false alibi during interrogation. This 13-year-old was later arrested for rape of a 3-year-old in the same residential area, though the prosecutors deemed it unprovable that he was involved in Kevin's death. To this day, no one can explain how young Kevin was moved from the crime scene to where he was found and what had truly happened to him. On March 2022, the brother received compensation of 1 million crowns, each from the state. Minister of Justice and the Interior Morgan Johansson affirmed that if the state is wrong, we must do our due diligence to rectify this mistake. Expressing well wishes to the brothers for their future endeavors. To this day, neither of the brothers has any recollection of what happened to Kevin, but they believe they did not commit the crime. For 19 years, the brothers lived with the burden of being the first children in Sweden to be implicated in a murder. Years of their lives have been taken from them, years that would never, ever come back. The Kevin case highlights the importance of continually discussing and ensuring children's rights within the legal system. The principle of presumed innocence until proven guilty must also be extended to our young children. I don't know if you know this, but like Professor Leif is like super uh, famous here in Sweden. He had been, uh, you know, in mo- a lot of high profile cases and like have analyzed them and talked about them on like media platforms and anything in general. So he was like, this is a murder. Okay, it's simple. And I, I also believe it was a murder. And um, it could have been the kids, you know, based on the victim analysis and everything. Um, you know, how the kids are brought up in this rough environment and like how adult-like I feel like Kevin was for being a toddler. He was four years old, but he felt like he was at least a minimum of like seven based on how he just walked around and hanged out with other people and talking to other people. And uh, um, and I also find it strange that the parents wasn't really looking for him until long after he was gone. And maybe that was normal back then, but I just think a lot of things were weird. But I wouldn't be surprised if it was a teenager that might have been a bit too rough and ended up killing him. Um, but it also could have been a pedophile because there was like a billion of them at that area. So, you know, who have also been sentenced. So that's why I wanted to ask you as another expert in this field, who would you think could be the perpetrator? They're all guilty. I'm joking. Okay. Um, (laughs) Okay. I think they shouldn't have let up on the pedophile lead too soon because it was like, oh, a pedophile that wouldn't go through that much work. Yeah, they would. Um, I mean, it really depends on the person, like, truthfully. Um, I think it was definitely a murder, and it's possible, like like you said, uh, there's a lot of pedophiles in the area, especially in close proximity, which shouldn't even be a thing. Like, why are they that close to children? But sure, whatever. Um, I mean, it is a rough area, so I guess, you know... They, don't they didn't care. really care that much. Mm. Which, I mean, I'm not saying I understand because I don't, but sure, whatever. Um, yeah, but I think they shouldn't have let go of that pedophile lead so quickly. Um, I feel like no child, unless they were a teenager, which I don't quite think this is quite up their alley either, um, would do this. Now, like a pedophile who may be this is the first time they're experiencing... But what would a pedophile just use a stick and, like... Because they should have seen signs, right, on the body. They saw that he was abused, but the only sign of the semen-like substance was ointment. So it wasn't really... Yeah, you know, like... That's why I It's was possible like, that, like, when a pedophile, like... when Especially if it's a pedophile who's never done it before, they can... Uh, they're going through these motions of like, oh, I like this. I want to do this, blah, blah, blah. But then in panic, they can do something like 
dump the body on kill them. or like yeah accidentally kill like because they don't know what they're doing and that's what i'm saying like i'm not saying guaranteed it's a pedophile but i'm saying there should have been a more thorough investigation because into the possibility a pedophile would have been have easier been. for for the pedophile to carry the child not leaving any signs on any the... signs of track it would have been completely easier so that's why i'm like i also been thinking about it but a teenager could also be strong enough to do that and there was a teenager who did the similar thing to another younger child um, right which is why you know because i think technically even a, a teenager can be classified as a pedophile can they? If I, remember I have no idea. It could. Honestly, I don't know. I don't know if it should be. I think it should be classified regardless of age. Yeah, I think they have to be like at least 16 or something like that to be classified. Like as when a, puberty starts or something. Like a, it has to be like a five year difference. So if he's four, like I guess they won't for like kids who are like nine. But if he's like. 13 14 15 then they would that they classify should know this person what's, yeah yeah they would classify the person i guess as but a even pedophile teenagers, usually they go after similar age like a closer in age that's why i'm like maybe they could be pedophiles i have no idea i honestly yeah but it's entirely he was possible 13 that... uh, where professor uh, leif was saying that the 13 year old i think it was i think it was 13 yeah a 30 year old who had been seen playing with Kevin on that day but he was later arrested raping a 3 year old mm-hmm. so that was a 13 year old child you know, it is crazy yeah. honestly I'm just, I'm just shocked that stuff like that happens but you know yeah, it's hard to say because they <laughs> didn't do much children, investigative everybody. work don't trust anybody honestly <laughs> Like, yeah, back in the day, it was different. You know, in the 90s or the 2000s, kids were young outside playing. And even when I was young, I was going to school by myself. Um, well, me and my sister at first, because we was going to the same school. But uh, I was going to school by I mean, myself. I, everybody was outside and, like, there weren't really anybody watching us. Yeah. I, like I said, we used to go to school by myself. What grade was I in? Like, third or fourth grade, I was going to school by myself. Mm-hmm. So like, and now I think four is extremely young, but I know like it's only a year difference between five and six, which I know back then we were able to do. I was able to go but to the store by like, myself. I feel at, like, like Kevin <laughs> seemed so adult, like not adult, like like he seemed so much older than his age. Like when they um, did the victim analysis, that's why I was like he seemed to be at least like seven in his behavior. That's mm-hmm. why I was like, nowadays, four, four-year-olds don't act like that, you know? Yeah. But, but I guess know. it's because of his environment and he's seen other boys or girls and other children, you know. For everybody who has listened to our previous um, episodes, we have had a similar case before with the Silja case. And they actually did compare also with another case in the UK... Um, and tried to draw like parallels of like maybe it's a serial killer who have been traveling across the Europe or whatever Um, but you know based on the results from those cases you know uh, compared to the UK one it was uh, heavily secured with cameras everywhere so they could see and have more evidence and you know the Silji one it was different because the kids who accidentally killed her actually went straight to their parents and told. And with this case, all the kids were lying and like didn't really tell the truth. So it was really hard for the investigators to even draw any parallels that were close to what this case ended up being. And, um, you know, that's why they try to get experts who are good with psychiatry and treating kids. And they got Sven Oke, who is the professor and who has been criticized for his previous work, as you already know, Thomas Quick one that we have also uh, made an episode of and the Arbuga woman. I'm not I'm sorry. The Arbuga one woman wasn't criticized, but he has also been part of that, which we also have, you know, recently covered. 
Um, but if you guys are interested in those cases, you can go ahead and listen to them, uh, especially the uh, the Silja case, which is kind of similar to this one, um, and uh, the Thomas Quick one, if you guys are interested in that. Um, I also wanted to say something about the brothers. Uh, I didn't really put it in the script, but the brothers were actually like kept away from their parents and their friends in the community for years. So they like was seen as the perpetrators for so many years until they were like, okay, you're not the perpetrators anymore. And, you know, their lives have been ruined and tarnished. <laughs> and um, they you know, had been going back and forth between foster parents and, like, psychiatry treatments. And, you know, the brothers were basically ruined. Not ruined, but they they, they felt like their life had been uh, ruined because of something that they didn't really do. So that's why I think it's important that we cover this case. Um because you know to learn and educate ourselves and be better so that children does not get that you know treatment because they have like usually when children or underage people commit a crime they get like treated very differently and they can be asked that these two brothers be put on like social services and like foster cares and you know all that and we already know the system like that is very crazy um so you know it's very important that we have better laws for underage people or kids so yeah that's pretty much what i have to say and if you feel like you don't have anything to put in Devante, we can actually continue with the food thing yeah, it's pretty self-explanatory, um, unfortunately, and you it's know, an unfortunate thing. So it's just an unfortunate thing, and then even then, the point is, we still don't know who did it. Technically, you know, case is by definition it's a child murder case, but it's technically still unsolved. So, it is actually uns- unsolved. Yeah. So there's they no. Still don't know. Uh, so there's no per. We don't know who did it. I mean, they and classified we don't know. it as an accident. So. Yeah, but they didn't actually do any investigative work, so it's hard to say if it really was an accident or not. So, Mm. yeah, we don't know. But, you know, it sucks, and it shouldn't be this way, but this is what happens when people don't do their jobs properly because of whatever they feel is the right thing to do. So we don't really know what happened because there was no actual effort made, at least based on the information we got online. So I don't really have much to say because there's not enough information. But uh, I guess to end the podcast on a nice, lovely note, something a little bit more lighthearted, you already know, we're going to go and talk about some food. Uh, And I feel like I could go for something simple, a nice little taco or a burrito. Sounds yummy. I think I'm just going to go for some salad because like my stomach been acting up like it's just like I need something mild. And a salad sounds nice. Maybe a Caesar salad. That sounds nice. Mm. Nice and fresh. Fresh. But, yeah. Thank you all for coming and listening. As always, we appreciate you. And we'll see you on the next episode. Yes. Peace out. Bye.